to the fourth TEDx campus. TED Talk really is, is someone who has a very distinct idea that's fueled by their point of view, that's supported by their mastery and research. When the TEDx call came out, I think it was in April, for October speakers, and the theme was The Future Revealed, I thought, oh my goodness, that topic is really made for this because we really are in uncharted territory. But I wasn't ready <laughs> yet. I was still really working through the process uh, and my thinking and the idea myself. And I thought, well, it's perfect, but I'm going to have to let it go. I just, I'm not, I'm not ready to submit. But I'm on the TEDx email list, and you know, one day in my email box came the call for. An open audition uh, and I guess I hadn't really read that clearly you know in April I've forgotten that that might be an opportunity and so when the call was for an open audition on a Thursday night you didn't have to sign up ahead of time you could just walk in and do the audition I th and I thought about it for a few hours and I thought this is an amazing thing this will create a deadline for me it's time for me to stop thinking and start writing the term paper. <laughs> and for anyone working in a, in a solo creative environment, you know, we could work forever and never let our work out of the bag, as it were. And though it's scary to come out, I thought, you know, this, this will be a good process whether or not I'm selected. Um, because it will really require me. I knew a little bit about the rules then about TED and how TED Talks were done. I, I obviously know a lot more now. Um, and I thought, really, I'm, I'm fine if I don't get selected. I really am because it'll be a good process. I had no idea how good a process it would be. I've never been required to really hone my thinking in under three minutes um, and to really let go of the notes and you know be able to to speak this piece and so so I it wasn't entirely clear um, because it just said you have to come and summarize your idea but I knew for me I needed to write my whole talk first uh, before I could get down to under three minutes and then it got me out of the starting gate and I've been through dozens of drafts um, many early mornings waking up about what do I really feel, what do I really think, what do I really think would be useful for others to hear. Probably on, on this audition, I don't know how many hours I spent, but probably in excess of a hundred hours in preparation for this. Not everybody would have to do that. 
uh, because many people are much more natural at this than me. But it was such a labor of love. Number 12, Jan Allen. I'm number 12, Jan Allen. When you think of people 60 plus, what comes to mind? Here's I what didn't feel say. a lot of anxiety. I felt a little bit. I mean, who doesn't have butterflies? You know when they're going to stand up and speak, but especially without notes. <laughs> it actually helped that we had to hold a microphone because one of my big problems is I don't know what to do with my hands. It went by in a nanosecond. And when I sat down, I wasn't sure I'd made my main point. I thought, did I say it? I couldn't remember whether I'd said it or not. So I had, I really did have a couple moments after that because I thought I might have missed my main point. <laughs> I just wasn't sure I said it. But the nice young man who sat behind me gave me a, a nice atta girl when I came, you know, when I came back. And so, so, so when it was over, I just quietly slipped out and, uh, you know, talked to a couple people on the way out. But I thought, it's done. Whatever will be, will be. And I'm happy that I've gone through the process. It's been about a, 10 days. All I've done so far is look at the longer version again and go, that needs work. <laughs> and I've been rethinking the title, which I'm allowed to do, and now I've gotten the welcome email and um, so I know more about you know what I need to do. I'm beginning to think about the visuals. Um, but it's going to be this week in earnest. I'm not going to revisit the idea. Um, because I really think I've reached the essence. I mean, through the process, I reached the essence of the idea. And so the bedrock idea is the bedrock idea. But the story around it may expand a little bit. But I think what I'll do, instead of taking, and I, this surprises me, instead of taking the long speech and editing it, I think I'm going to take the auditioned version and add a little bit in. Um, because I think the framework of the audition version works for me. A TED Talk really is a story amongst stories. It is taking us on a journey somewhere that we probably haven't thought about before. I'm not going to show up to an hour lecture on the future of nuclear energy, but I have 18 minutes in my attention span and patience to listen to somebody's point of view about it. And then coupled that back to back to back to back, it is like going to college for a day again, but with colleagues from all different disciplines and backgrounds. My work is actually about designing organizations. I work in the field of change management around work. I mean, if I look at the portfolio of work I've got now, I've got a, a, one of the African governments, I've got a conglomerate in another African country, a, a, a piece of work in the European Commission, so there's a certain government sector. But I'm also working with a, a consultancy for a piece of work and um, a retailer. It's um, organizations who are going through some form of something is happening for them, that they need to think about the way their organization is behaving, essentially. A different approach is, is one I think I'm going to go with at this point, but I'm still thinking about it, is the um, preparing yourself for any eventuality. Right. So on, on a range of possible scenarios, from an individual level and from an organizational level. One of the TED commandments is be vulnerable and be naked and all that. It's easy to tell personal stories about how individuals deal with thinking about the future of work and how they can prepare themselves. The, to teach students skills that will allow them to feel confident of their capability in more or less any situation, I, I think is, is, a, is a reasonable approach, given that you can't actually predict anything. My blog topic was last week on, you know, here are three possible approaches. The first one was about, you know, there's the apocalyptic future when we all go down the Cormac McCarthy road with our hacksaw and our hand knife killing each other. You know, and so what's the, is that work, you know? The, then there's a sort of utopian work where, where we're all in holograms and 
so on and so forth. And then there's a sort of business as usual with a few tweaks type of work. So there were sort of scenarios about possible futures of work. That, that was one route I started to go down. Then I offered another route in the blog about here are some questions about work, like what is work? You know, is, is gardening your own backyard work, even though it's unpaid and you're doing it for yourself? Or are we, when we talk about the future of work, are we thinking about paid employment that brings an income? Or are there other ways of, you know, what's the value of work? And why do people talk about um, working at their marriage, for example? Is that work? You know, so what is actually work? And then there was a sort of, the third approach was talking about what my working life has been like and what lessons I've learned from it that might be of value to other people. Then in the delightful way that, you know, fills me with joy and surprise and what have you, people responded, you know, saying, well, I think you should do two combined with three, and how about a bit of one with this, and have you read so-and-so? So, so in just putting it out there, so today I began to think, is this going to be a sort of crowdsourced blog um, TED talk? Several of them who actually know me and say, well, your story is, is very interesting, so make sure you tell your, some, some of your story in it. Do this with a bit of your stuff, how could that look? combined with just endless, if I look in my folders around TEDx Columbus, I've now got about 40 different papers of, of people pontificating about the future of work. They don't really say anything, they're selling notions which are non-actionable. And, and to work out what would be actionable for an individual in the audience is much more challenging. Uh, so I, what I'm doing is, in kind of organisation design terms, is surveying the field. If, if you can say to people, this is how you build resilience, if, even if you don't feel it, you can, you can practice resilience, and you can practice optimism, and you can practice, there's a whole body of research on learned optimism, um, which is fascinating, you know, and those are, those are very practical skills that will help people be in the future. Because the other thing about the work of the future is you're in the future every day. You know, as soon as you get a new Blackberry and you start to figure out, you know, where is the on button. What um, I'm thinking of doing now is, I think I've done enough of the kind of reading around the topic. Okay. And now I'm going to start thinking about the messages. And now I'm going to start talking to people. And, and then in about this slant that I think I'm going to pursue of my story with these, what I think I'm going to do is three scenarios, but we should be six minutes each. So it's got to be highly choreographed in a way. Yep. So I've, I, my, I've got a nephew who's 11, because he spends all his time playing this game called Minecraft on his computer. Okay. So my thought about that is, and a lot of people think game playing on computers for children is not a good idea. But, you know, that could be the future of work. And so this, how do you prepare an 11-year-old boy for the future of work? What, what is he picking up currently that's going to help him? Then there's a whole category of people who I find rather interesting of young women. Well, not, I can't decide how to categorize them, but women in their 30s. So I've got two daughters who are in their early 30s, and this person I had a coffee with this morning is in her 30s, and, and I know several other women in their 30s, and I work with them. And they're often in this big dilemma, which actually hasn't changed since I was in my 30s, of do I, do I accelerate my career and become a career woman, or do I look around for Mr. Right and have children and the workforce, un sadly and unfortunately, has not changed to allow women to not to have a career and children. And then the third category I'm interested in is people in my age group who are sort of early 60s, who, who for various reasons, maybe because they have lost their pension and have to carry on working, but what is work for them? Is it, a, a, and to some extent, it's 
much as work might be, you know, for the 11 year old. It's sort of, shall I get a paper round or shall I get a real job? Work changes when you're in that category. Retirement doesn't mean you even have to think about the word in the traditional sense. And, and, and the demographics mean actually you're not going to be able to and the economic situation means you can't anyway. So, you know, just forget that idea and think about different ways of preparing yourself for work, working into your future. And particularly for that age group, how you can stay healthy doing that, physically healthy and mentally curious. Because that mental curiosity and physical health are, are critical in that age group. Yeah, and they're all things that I could tell personal stories about, which would give the make them laugh, make us cry element. <laughs> so I'm honing my message. Then the next stage in about another week is to start finding, I thought I would find little clusters of people and do, like we're doing, do some practice go-rounds and they would critique it. Okay. Um, so whether it fitted into the 18 minutes, whether I'm being flaunting my ego inadvertently, whether I'm being too complex, trying to dazzle intellectually, which is another forbidden, and uh, you know, generally how am I coming across? The, uh, so, because I think if I pick different age groups or different mixes of people, and I'm going to pick people who I know won't pull any punches and do sort of little focus groups to try it out. That's my next step. The length of a TED Talk is determined by the curator. So it can't be longer than 18 minutes, but the curator, the person who's in charge of selecting the speakers, may say your talk is worth 12 minutes. And in that regard, the mechanics are dictated by have you done 30 years of research? 10 years of research, is your idea expansive enough to include 18 minutes of information? So that's one of the first mechanics. The second is there's no introduction of yourself. You get up on stage and talk about the idea. And the introduction of you is very brief. And I would say that the biggest mechanic of giving a TED Talk, if you want it to be successful and viral, is that of telling stories. If you watch a TED Talk live, you should be able to know which one will get a standing ovation by about midway through. Because of the emotion that those stories evoke and the journey that that person takes you on to that emotion and place that you may have never been before. Well, I'm in sort of the mucky middle. Um, it's, that's what my best friend and I like to call it. You know, the beginnings are exciting and the endings are exciting and uh, then you do the grunt work in the middle. Um, so I have gone back to my original draft of the speech or the talk, which was, you know, longer before I got it down to the under three minutes. And when I went back, it looked really, really flabby. So I spent a day or so rewriting it and got that done before the Labor Day weekend and put it aside. So, because it's always good to put it aside. And so I pulled it out today and I thought, mm, no. Yeah, it's a good thing I put it aside because uh, it didn't. It still wasn't flowing perfectly for me yet. I spent part of today rewriting it and watching a couple of other TED Talks. Every day I watch one or two. But I'm really now trying to choose the the stories that and the flow that will touch people in the way I feel touched by this subject. Well, I don't, I don't mean in the way that I do, because everyone will take it in differently, but in a way that they can feel it, not just hear it. And that's the challenge right now. The intense amount of work that went into getting to the core idea, um, you know, is, is behind me. That all happened before the audition, and that took a lot, for me, it took a lot of hours, you know, to get to that. And now I'm more in the how to tell the story, um, which I, ironically enough, is the harder, kind of the harder thing for me. Um, because I'm used to reading a speech, I'm used to being a little more academic about it. Um, so, so both pieces are really interesting parts of the TED 
commandments and um, process, and both extremely useful, I think, to get an idea out, you know, from the inside of somebody, and not just out, but but really honed, and then expanded, you know, into a story that can touch both intellect and, and emotion. I'm pretty sure there aren't going to be a lot of visuals, just a few. I don't think it's a, ta a talk that lends itself to a lot. Um, but both to cue me, just to be honest, since we're talking behind the scenes here, goes <laughs> between you and me, I want to be able to cue me too. But it's, you know, it's got to work for the audience. And I'm trying to think of how I knew I was finished, you know, with the three minute version. I think when it feels tight enough, it has to feel tight and like it flows. Right now I feel like it has extra words. Um, so I think when it feels sort of tight enough, but still rich enough, um, that I'll know. But at some point, you just have to stop. <laughs> so I have an internal sense of, of what I have to do. I think we're four and a half weeks out, I think, something like that, four and a half weeks. I think, you know, maybe four weeks from rehearsal and everything has to be Oh my gosh, four weeks from rehearsal, so <laughs> everything has to be, you know, ready and loaded and into the into PowerPoint and just practice on that day. Yeah. So, you know, I think I can sort of mess with it for another hmm, 10 days or so, maybe, maybe two weeks at the outside. Um, and then I want to, I want to say it's done and start practicing it and just living with it. Who's going to be your guinea pigs? Well, I have a couple of good friends okay. who have been reading my drafts um, for understandability, you know, and just to give me feedback about, yes, I get this, no, that point's not great. And I'm getting together with the, each of them separately, one's not in this city. Um, in the next two weeks, I'll be with them in person, and so, so I'll be able to also speak it, you know, to them. Okay. Right. Chloe will be. Chloe is always on duty. She's always on duty because I'll have to say it out loud a lot. No one, no one else will listen to it as often as she will. <laughs> she's resting up now. She is. <laughs> it's incredibly demanding. I, what I found is it's almost become a full-time job <laughs> because the. Um, the topic is the future of work, and it has to be engaging. So I don't want to just present a lot of facts and figures about work, because no, or the future of work, because there's no way of predicting the future of work. So I've started to delve into Minecraft and other computer games and look at what educationalists say about children who play computer games. Does it actually help them make better decisions? Does it help them be more sociable? Does it, or is it all something that parents should control and children can only have an hour or two a day on the computer? So that, so I've been investigating the pros and cons of the, those sorts of things to see if, if children are learning things that would be useful in the future like decision making and game theory and various things. So that's one thing. That the second age group was the women in their thirties, and that's turned into four interviews with women who all had particular differences. You know, some were married, some were single, some had children, some didn't have children, but they were fairly consistent in their views that they would they couldn't combine marriage and children and a career. So then my third age group was the uh, over 60s, what, what, what did they think about work? So I then met up with, well, I'm in that category myself, but I then met up with three or four other people and over 60. They wanted to have paid employment, but not necessarily a career in the same way that the 30-somethings did. The, the over 60s wanted to make a meaningful full contribution to the community, to um, feel that they were employed in some way. And then there is this whole thing about medical insurance and benefits again in the US. So that for future of work is a huge consideration in all age groups apart from the 11 years olds and it hasn't hit them yet. So the 30s and 60s are all tremendously worried about um, benefits 
So, so all of that has been a whole 10 days worth of more or less full-time working. The thing I'm thinking about next, as I was thinking about as I was coming back today, was, um, okay, how, I, I, I feel okay with the themes, and I've got the sort of personal story that they're interested in, because that's fine. But then it's the, the sort of visuals that go with it that I, I'm now going to start th thinking about. Because there's a, um, I can't remember the exact timeline, there's a timeline of when they want, if I'm, if I'm going to do slides, they want them by such and such a time, which I can't remember what it is. Well, this is one of the hopeless things, I'm t totally hopeless at visuals. Because okay. um, I talk, I see words mainly. But I work with all these visual and graphic people, so I'm hoping that they can help me over that hoop. What I'm going to do, and I've started to line up people, is do some dry runs so that I have the visuals and I have the outline and I have three little focus groups giving me constructive feedback on how I'm coming across and what I need to change. So I'm going to start them, or maybe when I'm in London next week I can try one. In fact, I'm doing three different ones, so one in, two in London and one in China, so that might be the three focus groups. Yeah, because if it works in in different languages and cultures, then that's quite interesting. On, on Friday, I'm going to be on a six-hour flight, and then Saturday, I'll be on an eight-hour flight, so two separate flights. So I would like to get off the flights, the endless a second flight, with with the whole outline of the talk ready to go and send off to the graphics people. I see. So that I don't have to worry about it while I'm in England and China, essentially, in terms of content. Um, the, the, the kind of next challenge is weaving my own personal story into it. There's a difference between writing a talk and illustrating it with visuals versus visually illustrating a story and talking from the visuals, if, if, I've, if I've said that right. Um, you know, rather than flowing from the words, flowing from the pictures. So whereas I thought having the visuals would sort of be the capstone, now I think it might be transforming the talk a little bit. Um, so I'm still in the middle of that, you know, and sort of figuring that out. It's not a lot of, lot of slides, but, you know, it's enough to sort of help make some of the key points, help me keep track a little bit, or, you know, help punctuate the key points. But it's, it adds so much. It allows me to, to talk more than give a speech, I think. At least I hope. Um, Ruth Milligan, who's one of the curators of TEDx, did a great blog post on the arc of a TED Talk, and she drew this picture of a TED Talk. Um, so I deconstructed my talk to, to say, does it sort of follow that, you know, and did my own these are my chapters and so on, because that's another way it'll help me remember. But, you know, there's, there are peculiarities to a TED Talk that are more than just telling a story. And so it was very helpful to have, have that too. But now it's time to sort of let go of the side of the pool, I think, and, you know, have the kind of architecture of the talk, but now start to play with it and practice and, and with the help of the visuals, not have to remember, you know, every phrase or every word, but be more into the story, you know, myself, I think. I mean, I don't know. We'll see. You know, I will work on it and then put it away for a number of days and then bring it back out, try to see it with fresh eyes. And I probably, I just this morning started talking from the slides because I wasn't used to doing that yet. And I don't even have a clicker at the moment. I'm just doing it on my laptop. And so I need to get in, in the rhythm of that before I start torturing the dog with <laughs> the entire the entire talk. And I'll want to do that more in the last week, probably, so that I don't it's just not boring to me. You know, it's not a topic that's boring to me, but you know how if you do something over and over, if you write something over and over, even you get kind of tired of it. And I wanna, you know, bring a freshness to it. So when you were over at uh, uh, mindset, mindset digital, mindset, yeah, mm -hmm. um, and you were, so I assume that you went through the talk with them, or did you just talk yes. through notes? And no, talk? we, you know, we went through whatever version I was on at the time. Betsy um, has been following along, you know, on the story 
for a little while and has known this is an interest of mine and so as friends you know we've had conversations about this so the topic was not brand new um, she is such a great presenter though that you know when she sort of came back to me with the slide she also had some suggestions about moving things around and how to they definitely when they present and they do 90 minute and beyond kind of presentations you know with hundreds of slides they think visually and they do the slides first you know, and then they're telling the stories around the slides. So she's, she's sort of edging me, you know, toward that. But, you know, I sort of kind of had an ethos about it that we weren't trying to slam 200 slides into to 10 minutes, mm -hmm. that, you know, we just wanted a few more high level, you know, guiding slides to help the visuals. So and I had a couple of suggestions, you know, for visuals. Um, that I think make the point, but but otherwise they they were just taking it in, asking me questions, and and there were some things that are personal stories that you know I knew I had photographs about that we could include, but otherwise you know we just I just kind of answered their questions and then they went off and thought about it, came back and proposed many more slides than you know we ended up. Mm -hmm. Using. Yeah, and this obviously we haven't bought this photo yet. This is called the Game of Life. Um, let's see, the sort of main point here about we're living much longer from an average 47 years in the early 1900s to 80 years today. So, you know, we kind of went from the visual of a chalkboard, you know, in the early 1900s to an iPad today. So, just some slides about retirement to help me make some of the key points. And then this, I think, very dramatic slide. This is Ohio in 2000. Three counties where 25% or more of the population are over 60. And by 2020, it looks like that. Um, the red, the, the orange being 25%, the red being 35% over 60. So you can see the dramatic increase in the, the number of people. Yes, it's only eight years from now. So that's the sort of simple deck. I'm just now learning to put the rhythm of the two together, but um, boy, I still am tempted to write like five words on my arm or something, <laughs> you know, that are the chapters of, of the, the talk that, that I'm doing so that I don't forget it. But, but I think that, um, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's like you work on every piece and part and then it all has to sort of sit and marinate for a little bit, um, then come back to it with, you know, some degree of enthusiasm and then really start to internalize it. But I feel good about, I mean, we're two and a half weeks or something like that out, almost three weeks out. So I don't feel like I'll be rushing or, you know, anything like that. And so one of the things we coach on real heavily is making sure that the villain is very clear. Because if you don't bring up the, the problem, you know, what you're trying to overcome, then any idea you present doesn't have as much punch, or the solution doesn't have as much, um, people won't be as empathetic with the solution, because they didn't have a primal connection with the villain. If there's no antagonist, that's correct. From a right, From a pure fictional standpoint, Joseph Campbell would, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, And but we forget about that in talking about these ideas, is that you have to have that, you still have to have that conflict um, in order for the audience to go on that arc with you. And that's what makes the emotion of a TED Talk so real. I did my rehearsal, so this was my second rehearsal. And th this time it was with, there were six British people in the room and one German person in the room. So that was pretty interesting because the German person thought I spoke too quickly. So that was a very good piece of feedback. And the, um, so, but I had shown them these TED Ten Commandments and said, you're supposed to critique me against these Ten Commandments. You know, so tell a personal story and sh controversy and all of that. So they said, well, it's, it, you've got all the stories which are great. And the, um, and they like the facts, and they like the presentation, and they like the slant. 
And the, one of them said, well, where is the controversy? You're, you're basically not being controversial enough. So now somewhere along the line, I have to build in some controversy. And then they had a, a small debate about this because there is a little sort of story I tell about an 11-year-old and computer games. And the German person has got a seven-year-old. And she gets terribly fed up with him for playing on his computer all the time. So she thought the fact that I said, I think we should allow kids to play computer games a lot, was tremendously controversial. <laughs> so what's controversial is clearly dependent on your world view of controversy, basically. The middle story, which is a story about me when I was 30, one of the women, said, one of the women in the room, who's now coming up for 50, said... This is so, afterwards, she said, that was so sad, I wanted to run up and hug you. So I thought that was quite good, because that was part of the Ted commandment of, you know, move me and be vulnerable and all that. The Seattle group, that was last week, yeah. gave me loads of tips, none of which came up today, which was good, about... Um, First of all, I was too rambling, and secondly, I hadn't linked the three stories into any coherent piece. And thirdly, they weren't linked to the... They could see I had all the pieces, they just weren't in a kind of link. And thirdly, well, I told too many stories and I got off track. So they said, be much more focused. So, for example, I talk about three types of work. So now each one of my stories relates to one type of the work. And then the so that the the and then for each type of work there's a story and then there's the a, a, a set of attributes you need to carry through in relation to the type of work. So it's very much more tightly knitted together. And then I read Ruth Milligan's blog about constructing a talk and she has got this nice image of a stem and flower petals and I realized that I read that after the Seattle feedback and realized that that was essentially what the Seattle people were saying where is the stem of the story that you're branching off from yeah. and relate things back the first time round, I didn't have the structure right and that's, what they, that's why they couldn't get the content. They said things like they were confused and they didn't know why I was telling this story. So essentially, having got that feedback, I think I was able to think it through a bit more so that now the people got the story. So maybe now the structure is right and now I work on the story. So to make the stories fit a little bit better you know like should I tell the glass the gold rope story and should I tell the I was an, only offered three choices of career as a woman so so they were all able to relate to some aspect of the store three stories that I told when I rehearsed with my work colleagues last week in Seattle I was it took 30 minutes so I cut down a huge amount, and that might be why I was talking so fast. And someone timed me this time, and it was 14 minutes. So now I can spend four minutes doing nice long pauses between the sort of key points. So I'm not going to put any more in. I'm just going to talk more slowly and be, and be more reflective, essentially. So the, the final go round with the Chinese people next week, I'll be able to ask them, A, if I'm speaking too quickly, and B, if I've now hit the exact time of 18 minutes. As, as I coach speakers, the hardest part for them is distilling down their message. And what I say is, I want to know one idea. You may have a collection of work that could fit on a huge wall, but I want one of your masterpieces. And then I want you to reveal the best insight you can against that one masterpiece. And what's hardest for the speakers is to kill the little darlings, is to get rid of all the other information and pieces that don't relate to that masterpiece, but may take you on the journey. I started in 1965 and I've gone on this journey for 30 years. No, I don't want the journey story. 
I want the inside story. I want you to tell me about the work in that particular masterpiece, not everything you've done. That, to me, I think is the hardest piece. If they haven't done that heavy lifting before, it's very difficult to get them to distill. And then keeping to 18 minutes for a lot of them is very hard. Um, but we have a clock and we have a countdown. We haven't had to pull anyone from the stage, and I don't expect to because they should be well rehearsed. I've done the little rehearsal six times now. This one took exactly 19, so I've only got to cut one minute. And the, um, so I'm, I'm getting the pace, pacing right. So the number of stories that I can tell is, depends on what I don't say, if you see what I mean. So I could say less about the figures and more about the, than more on the stories. They wanted to know what the, my stories were. And so I was wondering, because I, I have done myself those three types of work, so I'm, and I'm still interested in saying that there are three types of work, so I don't really want to cut it out just, for the, just to tell more stories kind of thing. They gave me feedback on, and I was, just, I was writing up the feedback earlier today, they, in sort of two camps. One was about my personal style, like open with a more strong opening that makes people laugh straight away. You know, so I think, oh God, that's not really my style. <laughs> and then they said, smile a lot more because you're very serious. And uh, people are often telling me that. They say that when I smile, everything changes, you know. So, so, so I'm thinking, how can I smile more when I'm terribly frightened? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to try and change the content because the, the actual basic structure is pretty okay, I think. It's the sort of... It's the sort of embroidery of it all and how I embroidered the stories pointed at the figures or pointed at the capabilities a bit more. And then the other thing that I will change, which I haven't put in as yet, is a bit more about my own career. They wanted a sort of timeline of my career. And in fact, thinking back, somebody in Seattle said that, you know, what was your career? How have you got where you are? Well, How come you're standing on the TEDx stage here, you know? Trying not to say, um, not pacing too much, um, not using too much crazy things that get in the way, um, not moving your head around the audience, even if there's 700 people trying to focus on one or two people to make it like a conversation. Um, knowing how to use your visuals, not turning your head, against the audience, not looking at your slides. We have a confidence monitor in front that allows people to know what slide they're on. Knowing how to sequence your slides with your talk. You, know, you, never, you never forward your slide before you start talking about it. You talk about the next slide and then forward. Those little things we coach on because they make a big difference in how a talk comes across. Things that we try to coach on that really play even more importantly in a TED talk because it's captured on video and it lasts forever. So it's not just, oh, I made a mistake on stage and no one will ever see it. Well, actually we can edit out those mistakes, but the reality is we want the continuum of your talk to be strong, both for the live audience and for the video audience. I feel pretty good. Um, the slides didn't work entirely, so, and I need to pick up the pace a little bit, but I really felt good that I remembered everything, and I've had, Ruth has been a great coach, actually, because I needed to, since the I need to totally rework my talk so it was more of a talk, less of a speech, had more of an arc to it. I had to stop scowling because I was scowling a lot, so now I'm trying to smile more, which I feel, but I just, when I'm concentrating, I'm not necessarily doing that. But actually, it felt pretty comfortable up there, and I'm looking forward to being able to look in people's faces because that's when, you know, you can feel a real connection or I can feel a real connection, and, and I draw energy from that. I went through the first critique with Ruth. I had to make a lot of changes after that. I mean, she really helped me see how to turn this into more of a talk. I practiced with friends who are really expert presenters. They gave me more feedback. I got my slides done. I've been giving this talk at 3 a.m. when I wake up and lay in bed. And um, so 
assuming everything works and I on the slides and I'm sure that it will um, I'm looking forward now three days ahead to starting to sort of slow things down I want to be fully present I think that's the most important thing we can do as talkers and speakers is to be fully present with our audience and not so preoccupied with how am I doing I want to now shift my thinking to thinking about the people in the room and how they might take it in. So I'm hoping to be able to do that now that I feel like I've got the content where I feel comfortable and I feel like I've learned it. Unlike some speakers, I was really refining my idea and the TED process itself, you know, helped me really evolve, you know, what my thinking was and that's continued on. So so I've been dancing this dance at multiple levels. It's not just writing a talk, it's also really evolving the substance, getting the content down and then trying to do probably what should have been six months of speech training um, to become a better presenter, in the, you know, one who can really reach an audience. It was just sort of part of the substance of my talk that we need to keep growing all of our lives and this is inducing a whole lot of growth <laughs> uh, which can be painful and it can also be enormously satisfying. The way it affects my thinking the most is that I realize how much preparation really does need to go into what appears to be an effortless talk that really can connect with people. I think I've been a little lazy in the past and so will I ever put myself in a situation where I don't have much of a safety net at all? Probably not. You know, I'd like to have notes, but I think I need to go beyond my comfort zone, you know, about that so that I can really fully be with my audience because when you do have notes, you know, when you see performers, you know, whether they're comedians or singers or Oprah or whoever, they obviously, I'm not comparing myself to any of those people, but there's nothing between them and their audience. And so I still have some growing to do to do that, but, but this has certainly given me a big taste of it. And we'll see how it feels, you know, before an actual audience. Ruth says it this way, she said, come with an open mind and a rested soul. And the next couple of days are about resting my soul because it's been terror city up to now. This is, today here in Columbus has been my sixth or seventh, well if you count the Birmingham thing, my seventh rehearsal. And each time it's getting more and more pointed, I think. And and poor old Jacob, who's doing the graphics, has now done the tenth iteration of it. How can I make myself stay on track so I don't do too, like I did today, too much at one end and not enough at the other end? And then the other thing is, because I spent yesterday writing it all out, which because I kept losing my thread, how can I learn the what I've written out in a way that doesn't appear learned. Well, a lot of the feedback I began with was stop waving your arms about. The Chinese people said talk much more slowly and pause between each section, which was which I've tried to do today. Then well, one time I had a laser pointer and was apparently sort of scribbling away with it. <laughs> they found very distracting. A lot of it was about, oh, and, and, there were actually a lot of questions about the posture, like don't walk around and don't wave your arms. To, you know, sort of, if you want to gesticulate, do it in a pointed way. So, and that's something that I think is actually useful because I'm I haven't seen myself on video, so I'm not aware of all these sort of physical mannerisms that I've got. It says turn up at eight, which I think is good actually because then. And they cite, she, the instructions say, you know, out of your respect to your fellow speakers, make sure you're sort of emotionally and physically present in the room, which I think it actually is, is sound. And it also, if I can manage it, will stop me thinking, what the hell am I going to say on the stage, you know, because hopefully I'll be listening. And um, I think that the, I wouldn't mind if it wasn't then going to go off into the internet. Because when, if it's 500 people and you're, that's as far as it goes, then if you make a mistake, it doesn't matter that much. But if it's 500 people 
and then another God knows how many, and you can't take any of it back and redo it. You know, it's just a whole different ball game. But basically, what I've been doing is is sort of every time I go for a run and any spare moment, sort of working out what I'm actually going to how I'm going to speak it, what to emphasise and what stories to tell, because each piece can have a different, totally different story. So although the slide deck is the sort of skeleton, if you like, what I can put on it can vary from moment to moment, which is where my thing about going off track is I must keep track of not going off track. I keep the focus on just relevant stories and not dive off into some nice to have story, especially with the clock ticking away. And then the, um, the what to wear problem. <laughs> resonated a particular note with me in her perspective on how we're going to face this third third. Please help me welcome Jan Allen. Stanford and her work as a consultant in organizational design, actually syndicated, that's what I like to call practice, her talk on three different continents. Please help me welcome Naomi Stanford, who's going to talk to us about the future of work. Uh, thank you. And I guess you're wondering which three compliments they were. One 
2018, I went to France and I worked on an assembly line. My job was to wrap the rope around the gold, wrap gold rope around the neck of the bottle and tie it up and then wait for the next bottle. They were coming down in front of the cookie. Is your co worker going to be a Japanese humanoid? I was offered three choices. I'm a woman. I was offered nurse, teacher, secretary. Now, fortunately, women in the I think I did okay. It was interesting because there was one guy in the audience who was nodding the whole time. So that was incredibly endorsing, you know. He looked interested, so that was good. The, um, and then some were just random people who come take, came dashing up and said, oh, yeah. Did you watch the tape from the other day? Yes. Oh, yeah, because you told me to, and I thought, God, I'd better watch it. The, um, and I'm glad I did because it was... I noticed some things like hand movements and things, you know, and then uh, I don't, I don't slow down enough to give people time to think. But in 18 minutes, it, but anyway, it's over. You know, I was so in the moment by the time I did go up there that I don't even remember it, you know, all that well now. I sort of, I felt like I was connecting with the audience, which I wanted to do. I hope that's true. Yeah. Um, and I and I felt fully present, you know, which is what I was able to do. The slide thing threw me a little bit, um, but you know, just had to keep going. And I've given this talk enough without the slides. I mean, in my head and to my dog. So. I got up at 6 o'clock this morning, went for a run with my journal. I didn't have a script originally, and then it, early last week someone said write a script. So I wrote a script, and then I started to try and learn the script. But that isn't actually my style at all. Mm. But it did, it did provide a, a tighter framework to have that script to work on. But then actually on the... And then Ruth was very insistent that you can't read from notes or have paper or whatever. So I then had to abandon the script, and I thought, if I abandon the script, then, it's, then I'm going to just start doing what I usually do, having the framework, but putting things in, which is exactly what I did. So, and this clock was ticking away. One of, one of the things that I was pleased about was I actually stuck to the time, but I rushed the end a bit, and I should have asked Ruth if there was any buffer time, because if I'd known there was two minutes extra, I needn't have rushed the end, you see what I mean? I, I got preoccupied by watching it go, 11 seconds, 10 seconds, yeah. and I ended up, I had three seconds spare. One of my sort of things that I do is respond in the moment, like I suddenly thought it would be a good idea to ask the audience how many people were in jobs that hadn't existed before. Well, that wasn't in the script at all, you know, but that, that actually, people rather enjoyed that. Someone sent me an email afterwards saying that was good to, you know, have a sort of straw poll type of thing, so that was interesting. Um, and then I, I was, the guy before me, that Terrell guy who was so hilarious, he mentioned it was TEDx, not Malcolm X, but I actually had a Malcolm X quote, and then I pointed that out, and then nobody thought that was in the remotest bit funny, I thought. Oh, Somebody said, which I also thought was interesting, because I had that debate with myself, that the first slide, the three types of work, was on too long, and originally I had that as three separate slides. And it may have been better to keep it as three separate slides. So that was that. But nobody had pointed that out in the rehearsal, so, or any of the rehearsals. So that, that's just a question mark. What I did really enjoyed was afterwards, it was clear that people had got something from it. The, one of the guys behind the camera came up to me afterwards, and as he was leaving, he said, that was great, he said, I was watching, I was doing, working the cameras. He talked about Minecraft, and he said, that's my favourite thing, and he told me all about his Minecraft experience. And clearly, even doing the work, he was actually listening to the talk and being intrigued by it. And then this delightful woman, literally pushing a Zimmer frame, came up to me and she said, I'm 79 and I'm just getting my first job. I was so enjoyed what you said about your father. <laughs> but in terms of the process, I think just a bit more education from 
the, rather than, well, the TEDx commandments are fine, but also, you know, here's some ways of approaching this. You need to do this amount of research, do some informal rehearsals, have yourself videotaped, you know, be aware that it's going to have a lifespan of who knows how long. Um, all things that you learn as you go along. Would I have done it? Yes, I probably would, because I always say yes to stuff. But w would I have... What is it of value to other people? And is it of value to my organisation? And is it of value t to me having done it? It's impossible to say. The, the value of the talk is... I enjoyed doing it, and I was glad to have done it. And the work put into it is all, you know, when I'm a billable consultant and trying to do a hell of a lot of research, it's, a, it's another part of the work it loads that you have to balance. They were very encouraging. And on the theory, which may, we don't know if it's right or not, but it may be right, that it will raise, I mean, you're not allowed to really to say what company you work for or anything like that, so nobody theoretically would know. But the, they were of the view that it's, that people could find out where I was employed and all that, if they were interested in what I was saying. And it could well be very useful, you know, and they certainly put it out on the company website and encouraged it through t the Twitter thing, everybody to look, and, and everybody in the company was, you know, I got lovely emails, good luck, and we're thinking of you, and we're going to watch it, and all of that sort of thing. So for the company, it was, it was, they were pleased that I was doing it, so that was good. The only thing is, then, then of course, it has to be good. You know, there's no point having a rubbish TED talk <laughs> <laughs> showing how awful you are. <laughs> About the whole experience, I feel great um, because I really do. I do think it was sort of living the thesis of my talk, which is that all of life is either growth or decay, and we have to induce our own growth, and this induced my growth. <laughs> you know, my own standard for myself is, did I do my best? You know, or as my sports nut husband would say, did you leave it all on the field? And I found I left it all on the field, you know, that I gave it my best. It was scary. You know, I've never sort of been out of control, <laughs> uh, because usually when I'm publicly speaking, I have notes. And I think that that and the time frame kind of flipped me out. I felt a connection to the people in the room, and I thought I could, I thought I would feel it, I thought I felt it coming back. Well, I think I spent, I had to spend so much time refining the idea, which at the end of the day looks, you know, quite simple when you present it. But I spent so much time on content that I, I wish I would have focused on presentation skills a little bit more too. Well, I clearly didn't have a sense of how to do a talk. You know, what I, what I wrote for many drafts was a speech. And, you know, had I understood, you know, a TED talk a little better a little earlier, you know, that might have been a good thing. But, you know, on the other hand, you know, I can almost, I wish I were more visual because I can almost see the stages of understanding the anatomy, you know, of a TED talk, um, which is very different. And I really applaud the guy who created it. Um, there wasn't a speaker I talked to, and a lot of the people you know speaking this year speak a lot. You know, they're either professors or they're, they're on the, the speaking circuit or whatever. Not one of them felt this was like anything they'd ever done before. And um, there's something really rigorous about it on the one hand, and really collegial and connecting on the other. It's really brilliant, you know, in, in its architecture. But, you know, I, Ruth really helped me learn more about storytelling, too, and more about, you know, there was at one point I had to draft that she said, the story goes like this <laughs> when it needs to go or like this, <laughs> you know, so that it's a journey that you help take the audience on. So I was like learning every day, every day, every day, every day, you know, and trying to incorporate what I was learning. Anticipation is harder than encounter. And so I was doing a lot of isometrics like this to try to breathe. But once I hit the stage, I don't know if it was apparent or not. I was breathing, you know, uncomfortable. Right, you know, we had 
we had actually done a new slide deck that refined all the slides and somehow it didn't make it. What is your next, at least the way I was seeing it, didn't come up as a full sentence. And um, so then I had a couple of rogue slides in there that I just, you know, that I had taken out, yeah. but we're back in. <laughs> so I just cycled through those, but that almost threw me off. You know, that I thought, can't let that throw me off. You know, just have to keep going. Um, one of my friends who has been the person who read all my drafts, and you know, she thought I was less comfortable in the first third of the speech than, you know, the last third, and I think that was part of reacting to yeah. the slide thing. You know, the other thing is it just takes you a minute sometimes to, to get into it. So you ask about would there be anything I would have done differently. You know, I really don't think so. I mean, what I'm really focused on now is, so what are the big, my big takeaways, you know, from this experience? One is the, I'm a believer in gap creation. Whenever you can create a gap between where you are and where you want to be, that creates movement. And so by, I was remembering when I decided to audition, um, I created a, a file, a computer file, that said TEDx Talk October 5th, 2012. And I didn't know if I was going to make it, you know, if I was going to be selected, but I was determined, I, I was actually okay whatever the result was going to be because I, I knew that the process itself would be really important, you know, in helping me move forward. The second thing is uh, that it took a posse <laughs> to get me up there on that stage. It, it's, I mean, the content is mine, and I certainly wrote the talk, but, you know, I had two people read all my drafts. I had three or four people help me with presentation. Uh, I had a whole lot of people support, you know, presentation style. I had a whole lot of people supporting me. I had people help with my slides. Um, I didn't do this myself and you know in life I think we really need support you know to do this kind of thing and the third thing is I felt like I had to grow a lot you know in two or three months but I think what lasts is I feel good about the work you know and the investment and the time and the learning and the growth and all of that so I think there's a lot of gain you know, in growing. Prepare. Prepare. I mean, first I would, you know, if they were just asking advice about is it is it a good thing to do, is it a useful thing to do? I mean, I think you can hear from what I'm saying. I, I do have an idea to put out there and I hope to, you know, create a social enterprise to help match people to their next. Um, but that's not, I didn't do this to advertise something. You know, and I think a lot of people may come to it with that, and that's okay. You know, it's you're spreading ideas that matter, but I would really focus on the worth of your idea, your belief in it, your passion, and your passion around it, and your willingness to do a whole lot of work to sort of keep the social compact with with Ted. Um, Ruth came to you and said. Uh hey, next year we've got a whole different concept. We'd like you to participate. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'll be a big supporter. <laughs> These aren't one-time, one-off kind of things. You know, you come out a different person than you go in. And, you know, I had a friend who just emailed me today. Uh, she's older than I am. She's a very prominent member of our community. And she went for part of the day. And the thing that impressed her the most was she knew maybe a dozen people in the room, she thought, out of 700. And she's a person who's, as I said, very well known in our community and has done beautiful, great work here. And um, she was just really impressed by the diversity of the audience. What a TED Talk really is, is someone who has a very distinct idea that's fueled by their point of view, that's supported by their mastery and research, which then gives us license to be influenced by them about this idea. It is an 18-minute talk. It is a story amongst stories. It is taking us on a journey somewhere that we probably haven't thought about before.
I had no idea how good a process it would be.